Hello everyone and welcome back to To Be Like Christ. If this is your first time here and you're here to study, welcome. My name is Luke and this study is our fifth study now in the New Testament. We've already looked at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's notes out there and videos out there for all of that stuff. Now we're moving on into Acts, so I'm excited about this. And I, I do want to mention a few housekeeping things before we, we move on into the study and into the notes. The first one is, I'm anticipating the study will probably take six months. I want it to be comprehensive. I want it to be something that's valuable even into the future. And I want to create some really good resources, the verse by verse notes, and then another resource for uh, people to be able to use, you know, just indefinitely. So there will be new resources that are out on the website and on the YouTube channel almost on a daily basis. I'm going to say probably five out of seven days of the week. There'll be some new piece of content on the book of Acts uh, up until the time that we finish this study. I thought about putting deadlines on when I wanted to be through the book in different chapters and when I wanted to create certain things, but I've tried that in the past and because life is so um, unpredictable and you have to be flexible, I just, it, it never really succeeded. We've already had to push this this course back uh, a week, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to say that I'm gonna put out content steadily and it's all gonna be available for free for download on our website. Why is it free? Some people ask, well, it's because there's pa there are patrons who support this work. So the people all across the world, whether they have money or not, can get access to it. And I just wanted to thank uh, those who are supporting the work that we're doing. And if you're interested, there's a link to our patron account down in the description. All right, what else? What else do I need to mention? I know that it's hard for some people to watch these videos on YouTube, whether because of like data rates on phones or because uh, you need a faster internet connection or whatever. If that's you and you would rather listen to these on podcast, we've got them on our po our podcast site, which you can find Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, basically, I think Spotify, basically all the places that you might want to get them. Um, if you have any questions while we're going through this, feel free to leave them down in the description below, and I'll try to get to those if you need some clarification on something. And I do want to say the reason that we pushed this course back was in part because my wife has just finished a course. So if you, it's very good. I edited it, so I, I listened to the whole thing. It's mainly geared towards women who want to regulate their nervous system, uh, work through trauma in their past, work through difficult times, uh, help fix relationships with other people. So it's, it's nervous system regulation from a... A holistic perspective. My wife is a certified nurse practitioner and she is also a certified uh, functional medicine provider. So she's got uh, quite a bit of knowledge and she's combined a lot of this into her course. And I'll link that down in the description below. That's actually the reason that this course was delayed, but it, it, was, it was a good reason. So, <laughs> okay, let's talk about the book of Acts. Let's jump in. Uh, we've we've got some just a brief introduction in these verse by verse notes. I will say that there's a lot more introductory material in the handouts. There's a timeline of the book. There's a highlight, oh, a, you know, a kind of a high level overview of the major events of every chapter. There's a discussion about. There's all kinds of stuff, right? So check out the handouts if you want more information. This is just a concise, brief introduction. So the book of Acts, which is kind of short for the Acts of the Apostles, tells us what happened after Jesus left the earth and he went back to heaven. You know, while Jesus was on the earth, we're told in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that he had amassed quite a following of people. And so the question is, well, what happened to those people after Jesus left? Did he just abandon them and they were, you know, left to fend for themselves? Or, well, well, that's really the story of Acts. And we're going to meet a lot of, I guess, famous Christian characters, famous Christian men and women in this book. But I think it's better to focus rather on the way that God was working through those people rather than saying that the, the success of the early church was the accomplishment of those men. 
maybe the book would better be titled The Acts of the Holy Spirit or The Acts of God rather than The Acts of the Apostles because maybe that's misdirecting the credit for the success that we're going to see as the church grows here in the early years. But that's a rabbit hole that I've dealt with in another handout. <laughs> so anyway, let's not give away any more spoilers. I'm going to take a drink and then we're going to read the first couple verses here. Ah, lemonade. Okay, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the writer doesn't reveal his identity in this opening line. However, he does address the book to a name by the name. By, to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he mentions a first book that contains details about Jesus' life. Okay, so those are some hints. And maybe, if you were with us for our last study, which was the Gospel of Luke, there's a reason I did the Gospel of Luke after John, even though that's not the order that they come in in the New Testament. And the reason is, is because who was the book of Luke addressed to? Do you remember? A guy named Theophilus, right? That almost certainly the same, the same man. He says he says that this first book contained details about the life of Jesus. Well, that's the Gospel of Luke. And so, what we can gather from this opening line of the Book of Acts, we can gather the author. It's the same guy who wrote the Book of Luke, who is well, Luke. <laughs> and if you want to know more about him, we have a handout on him. Uh, and that this is now the second book. So Acts is a follow-up to the Gospel of Luke. They flow right together. If you read the end of Luke and then you pick right up in Acts again, you'll see that they're, they're directly connected. Luke ends with the resurrection, or sorry, the ascension of Jesus, and Acts picks up on the ascension of Jesus and gives us some more details and then continues the story. So it's all one continuing story. So don't disconnect what's written in Luke from what's written in Acts. The four Gospels, they record everything that Jesus did from uh, basically his birth to his ascension back to heaven. And there was, he mentions here in uh, verse 2, that he had given them some commands through the Holy Spirit. He had given his apostles some commands from the Holy Spirit before he ascended back to heaven. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. But who are these apostles? Jesus gave some instruction to these men before he left. Who were these guys? Well, Jesus had 12 hand-selected students. They're basically his closest associates. They were with him all the time. And they were the people who were going to be entrusted with the leadership of the early church and helping the church get off the ground, even though Jesus wasn't there any longer. When we open up the pages of the book of Acts, there's not 12 apostles anymore. There's actually 11. And do you remember the reason why? Luke tells us in his gospel that there was one named Judas Iscariot, and he betrayed Jesus, and then he killed himself. So we went from 12 to 11. So these 11, they had received some promises from Jesus, and they're kind of waiting now for those promises to come true. Verse 3. He, that's Jesus, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Jesus' suffering is mentioned here. What's that a reference to? I think it's quite obviously a reference to his crucifixion. But what do we know happened after the crucifixion three days later? Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he spent the next 40 days going around making appearances to hundreds of people to prove that he had actually resurrected from the dead. This is going to be important because our hope is in the fact that Jesus resurrected. And so some eyewitnesses are, are key to be able to, uh, to make that case. Some of Jesus' appearances are recorded in Luke chapter 24, and some, some others are recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 which is a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church sometime later. But 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, maybe go check that text out and see uh, some of the details that are included by Paul. Now, the end of verse 3 is really important. Jesus resurrects. He spends 40 days making appearances. And it says that he was preaching about what? 
speaking about the, quote, kingdom of God. Now, the concept of the kingdom of God was really key in Jesus' teaching. It's called the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew. And Matthew's, you know, he's always talking about the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> uh, so it's a key teaching point. And the idea of the kingdom of heaven was actually introduced to the Jewish people, the Israelite nation, back in the Old Testament. Their prophets were always speaking about this, about a day when a kingdom, a great kingdom would come. God's kingdom. Well, God appeared to a guy named David, who was the king of the Israelites like a thousand years before Jesus. He appeared to David and he said, David, one day one of your descendants is going to sit on your throne, but he's going to be an everlasting king. He's going to have an everlasting kingdom. His kingdom is never going to be destroyed. You say, oh, that's interesting. That's quite a promise because kingdoms don't typically last forever. Think about it. Uh, you know, we, we, we would probably be quicker to call them nations today than kingdoms, but think about the ancient world. You've got kingdoms like the, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the, uh, you know, more closer to modern history, you've got uh, nations like the United States, or the great British Empire of old, or the Spaniards, or the uh, the Ottoman Empire, or the Austro-Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian, is it Austro, uh, whatever, my, 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 uh, my, my history is rough, I went too far, I said too many things, <laughs> repeat, delete, cut that part of the video, a anyway, <laughs> you've got all these kingdoms throughout history, but what's one thing that has been true of every single one of those nations? What's true is that they eventually crumbled and fell. They eventually, you know, they rose to prominence, to greatness. Maybe they had some great kings who led them. Maybe, maybe no other uh, nation illustrates this greater than uh, the Greeks. Alexander the Great, this great charismatic leader who led the Greeks to conquer the world in, in just a series of years, in a few number of years. And then what happened? Well, a couple hundred years later, the empire kind of crumbles, it falls apart, and they're, they're displaced by the Roman Empire. And so kingdoms rise and then they fall. And we've seen this cycle throughout history again and again and again and again. It's always true. You, know, you might argue that the United States is the greatest nation in the world today, economically, militarily, but there will be a day when America is replaced by some other nation if God lets the world stand that long. Kings castles, uh, uh, all the powerful symbols of an empire either die or they crumble or they, they go in, you know, think about all the great structures of the ancient empires. Where are those things today? Uh, the great cities, the great walls, the great fortifications, uh, almost all of those have like crumbled back into dust. Right? And the same thing will happen if the if, the world continues. So that's what happens to most or all kingdoms, except there's this promise from God to David that he's going to set up a king and a kingdom that will never be destroyed. This is God's reign over all of the earth. Uh, and eventually this reign and this king, everything is going to be subjected to him. Eventually one day, all sin will be destroyed. All the people who do evil in the world will be removed. Sin will be taken out of the picture and death will be taken out of the picture. And everyone will, will worship and submit to this great king. Well, who is that great king? Well, Jesus came and he taught that the kingdom of, he of heaven was arriving on earth and that he was a descendant of David, and that he was the Christ. What does the Christ mean? Christ means anointed. He's the anointed king. So if you're going to be a king forever and have a kingdom forever, what do you have to do? We well, have to beat death, right? Well, who beat death? <laughs> who conquered the grave? Jesus did, and Jesus is the only king to ever do that. Right? So this is the introduction kind of of, of the, uh, the kingdom of God on earth. You now have your king. You now have your kingdom. There's a new nation of people. And Jesus was inviting people to, to put their citizenship into this new nation. To put their citizen, 
can't pronounce that word, citizenship into the kingdom of God to swear their allegiance to the one true king. And who was that? Well, it was him. And so what is this kingdom of heaven? Well, it's the, it's the nation of God's people. It's God's special people who've been called out of the world. That's today, I mean, in the modern sense, we would just say that's the church, right? And the church is called a nation, a peculiar nation uh, set apart. And uh, so I, I think this is the idea that the kingdom of God is coming. Jesus is the king. God's reign is coming. Give your allegiance to him. Don't waste your time serving other people, serving human interests, serving these kingdoms that are going to be destroyed. Put your allegiance in the eternal thing. And in the end, you are guaranteed to have victory because nobody is overthrowing or outlasting Jesus. All right. Oh, so that's my current understanding of the kingdom of heaven. It's my understanding has been maturing over the years. Did I already say this? I don't know. It's been maturing over the years. And it's still, I, I think, evolving and, and growing and pieces are coming together. So, But that's as I understand it in the moment. Okay, so verses 4 through 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. So Jesus told the apostles not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I think I shall take a drink. Sorry for the uh, guzzling audio. I will admit that this is the third time I'm filming this video because it's like it's been like nine months since we've done one of these studies and I'm super rough. I should probably check that my audio is being recorded. Okay, I think we're good. But um, yes, this. so my throat is very dry because uh, I've already been talking for an hour and uh, I restarted the whole video because it was so bad. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about verses four and five. Let's read these again. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So in the 24th chapter of his book, of his, go <clears throat> of his gospel, Luke wrote that Jesus had commanded the apostles to stay... <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> COVID. <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> Jesus had told the apostles to stay in Jerusalem after he departed from them and ascended and went back to heaven. He, Luke 24 verse 47 says that the message of, quote, repentance for the forgiveness of sins was to be preached first in Jerusalem. So that's where the, the, the kingdom of heaven on earth was going to, it's kind of its launching point. In Jerusalem, the apostles were to receive something that was going to help them carry this mission forward. And this is described as, quote, the promise of the Father. Luke 24, verse 49 says, And behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Okay, so the promise is described in a couple ways. It's described as power from on high and as a baptism or an immersion in the Holy Spirit, according to verse 5 of Acts 1. Now, this can be a somewhat complicated issue, but I'll present my best understanding of it. If I understand it correctly, this is the same promise that Jesus made to his apostles back in the upper room in John 14, 15, and 16, right after they had eaten the Passover before Jesus' death. And let me read you a couple of those verses, and I think it'll help us to understand. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Okay, so Jesus says there's going to be a Helper who comes, and this Helper is the Holy Spirit. And he's going to help you remember the things that I've talked to you about. They're going to help you kind of connect the dots and then to be able to present those, uh, those connections to other people so that they can understand 
why I came, what my mission was, what the gospel message is all about. Right? So the apostles were going to need help after Jesus left, but there was a promise that the helper, the Holy Spirit, would be there. Uh, let's read another one, John 16, 12 through 14. Jesus says to the apostles, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whoever he but whoever he hears, he sorry, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So again, a promise that the Holy Spirit's gonna come and is going to empower the apostles to preach the gospel successfully and to witness to the resurrection and to the work and life of Jesus. Now, it's described as a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there's been a lot of debate about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. But I, I really just don't think it's that complicated when you look at the scriptures, right? So don't, don't let anybody else define this for you. Let's let the Bible define it for us. Now, you may know what baptism is. Uh, John the Baptist, you remember him from like the beginning of the Gospels? He went around baptizing people in water. He was immersing them under the water and then bringing them back up. Jesus did that as well, at least his, his disciples did. We're told in John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he baptized people in water. So were the apostles literally going to be baptized in some Holy Spirit substance? Well, no, I don't, I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is baptism just means to dip or to immerse. And so the apostles were going to be immersed in the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit would then enable them. And he would, he, would be, uh, he would fill their minds with what they needed to know in order to be able to preach Jesus effectively. Not only that, but he would be working in them in miraculous ways so that they could perform miracles and heal sick people and cast out demons. And we're going to see all of that in the upcoming chapters. So just know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that I think is specifically uh, promised to Jesus' apostles. And it is, I had another point and I forgot it. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. It's, it's something that's specifically promised to Jesus' apostles. It's something special that they are going to receive. I don't think that it's something that is a promise to just all people everywhere, right? Keep it in context. Notice to whom this statement is addressed. And we're going to see that the apostles had a very unique empowering from the Holy Spirit that it doesn't appear that anybody else received throughout history other than Paul, but Paul was an apostle. We'll talk about that later. Okay, <laughs> so what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's the apostles being immersed in the Holy Spirit's power so that they can carry the kingdom of God forward. That's my most concise answer. Jesus told the 11 that this was going to happen not many days from now. So they weren't going to have to wait long for the Holy Spirit to show up. And we know from uh, the, the Jewish calendar that about 10 days after Jesus ascended back to heaven, the apostles received this, this help from the Holy Spirit. Just a side note here on this verse. This is a helpful verse in helping us to form a picture of the nature of God in our minds. Obviously, God is more complex, certainly, than I think any of us could ever imagine. But verses like this show us that there are, maybe you've heard about the, ter the term the Trinity, and you maybe looked that up in your Bible and you realize, oh, it's not there. Well, the Trinity is really just describing the nature of God as we understand it. So there's three persons, three identities that share the nature and the characteristics of God, of the divine. And they're all mentioned here, and they're all mentioned as working distinctly, or uh, uh, in unison, but in, in specific ways. There's the Holy Spirit, there's Jesus, and then there's God the Father. And these three are united in purpose, in desire, in will, and they're all working together, right? So this is why we say the Trinities, because these three identities share the nature of God. It's kind of a hard concept, but I think on a basic level we can understand. All right, let's read verse 6. So when they had come together, when the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, quote, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
we aren't told specifics, but there must have been some kind of finality to this meeting. They knew that Jesus's work was about completed, right? And so they ask him this question, is it time for the kingdom of Israel to be restored? Now, what do they mean by that? Well, the Old Testament does talk about a restoration of the nation of God's people. However, um, I don't think what the apostles had in mind was what the prophets had actually spoken about. As we discussed in the Gospel of Luke, many of the Jews seemed to think that the Messiah was coming to initiate or the Christ, this king who had been prophesied, that he was coming to initiate like political reforms or military reforms, that he was literally going to build a physical kingdom and that the nation of Israel was going to be great again. Right? But that's, as we mentioned, that's not exactly the type of kingdom that Jesus had in mind. He, to he told Pilate during his trial, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not here to build structures that are eventually going to crumble and fall apart. Right? I've got something bigger in mind. They thought that the Messiah, or uh, some of the Jews, thought that the Christ was coming to throw off their yoke of Roman oppression because the Romans were in charge of them at this point in history. But again, that's not what Jesus had in mind. I think this is probably what they're asking about here in verse 6. They're asking, hey, is it time to uh, set up our kingdom now? And Jesus is like, mm, not exactly. <laughs> okay, verses 7 through 8. And he said to them, so this is his answer, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' answer implies that it wasn't time for the restoration of Israel, at least not in the sense that they had in mind. Jesus doesn't really give them specifics as far as an answer here. He basically just tells them, he says that it is not for them to know the times and the seasons that God had, um, had designated. It's not for them to know how God was working among the nations right now. That wasn't what they needed to be concerned with. I think he, he may have taken this phrase, times and seasons, from Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. And that verse is in your notes if you want to check that out. But it, it well, I'll read it. Daniel 2, 21. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So that verse is about God working among the kingdoms of the world and bringing some down and raising some others up to prominence. And Jesus is basically saying here, God is doing that. He's working on that. But he, the details of that are not for you to be concerned about. So we're again, we're not talking about earthly kingdoms and the rise and fall of these, these national empires. Jesus told them that God the Father had a plan for those nations, but what they needed to be concerned with was what he was just talking to them about. They were going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. That's what they needed to be waiting on, and then they would know what to do. So they were to use that power to do what? To witness to Jesus in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think it's interesting that they wanted to know about their specific nation, uh, the Jews, but Jesus was going to give them a mission to every nation. This responsibility that they were given of being witnesses to Jesus and what he said, what he did, the way that he talked. Some of the apostles would be entrusted with writing these gospels that the Holy Spirit would inspire them to write so that generations could know about Jesus and the things that he taught for, for years and years and years into the future until Jesus comes back, basically. And so they were, that was their specific role. They were going to be witnesses of Jesus. And nobody was better equipped to take on that responsibility than the apostles. No one was better acquainted with Jesus but the Bible is clear that their association with Jesus wasn't enough. They needed the Spirit's power. So Jesus tells them to go and to wait. And when they received it, they would be equipped to, quote, make disciples of all nations, according to Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. All right, now let's, uh, let's talk about verse 9. And I think we're going to end this study in verse 12 today. So just a couple more verses here. Verse 9, 
And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. In his gospel, Luke already gave us an account of Jesus' resurrection, but he includes some details in this account that he didn't include already. Luke chapter 24, verses 50 and 51, say that he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So it gives us a location uh, somewhere around Bethany. Bethany was a couple miles from Jerusalem to the east. As far as we know, the, or Jesus had never left the apostles in this way. And again, there must have been a sense of finality to this. And you have to wonder if the apostles were a little bit confused. You know, just a second ago, they were asking about whether or not Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom and restore the Jews to prominence. And like three seconds later, he's gone. <laughs> so uh, what exactly are we doing here? Now, if they were confused, their response, it, it was admirable. And I think it's something to point out here, and I think this is a lesson that we can take from it. Luke 24, verse 52 says that they worshipped him and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So they did as Jesus told them, and, and they were happy. Maybe they didn't know what was going on. Maybe they didn't know what was next. But they trusted Jesus. And I think it's interesting to compare the apostles' response in in, in this chapter, to the apostles' response to the crucifixion back in Luke's gospel. Do you remember what happened when Jesus was crucified? Well, some of the apostles denied ever knowing Jesus. They were distraught. They, they had no idea what was going on. They ran and they fled and scattered, and they probably thought that you know, maybe they had picked the wrong, the wrong Messiah or something had gone terribly wrong and God's plan hadn't worked out the way that they thought it was going to work out. Right there, it just it was a mess. But here, even though they may have been a little bit confused about what Jesus was doing and the promises that he was making, they trusted that everything was going to be okay and that God was in control of this situation. I think there's a good application there for us, and that is, think back on the time times in your life, maybe times of anxiety, maybe times of uh, of doubt times of trial, and ask yourself, did God bring me through those situations? And I imagine your answer would be, yes, he did. And maybe they weren't as bad as I thought they were going to be, or maybe they were hard, but God still brought me through them, and and I grew and developed and matured through those things. God brought us through those. Yes, he did. So I think the lesson to be learned here, and I think the apostles did a good job at learning this, We cannot forget God's past faithfulness when confronted with present doubts and anxieties. Don't forget how faithful God has been to you in the past when you face some new trial. Jesus showed the apostles that he was worthy of their trust. And I can assure you that God is worthy of your trust. And maybe your past proves that. Well, don't forget it when you face some new trial. You know, don't think that everything's out of control. Look to the past and remember all that God has done for you in, uh, in, the, in those years. And I think when we remind ourselves, when we preach to ourselves about God's past faithfulness, it will relieve us of that present anxiety. And uh, I think that's a big part of Christian maturity. It's being able to face the similar circumstance, being able to face similar circumstances that once cast us down into into anxiety and and exhaustion and trouble and doubt and depression and facing those circumstances again and saying i remember this and i remember how god was with me the first time and i'm not going to allow satan to drag me down into those depths this time because god's going to be with me just like he was last time first peter 5 verse 7 casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you okay verses 10 and 11 And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is kind of interesting. As the apostles were 
watching Jesus, probably hoping to catch the last glimpse of him as he disappeared into the clouds, there were these two men who almost seemed to appear out of thin air by the apostles. It says that they were wearing white robes. We aren't explicitly told that these were angels or that they were some kind of heavenly being, but it seems almost certain that Luke implies this, or that he wants Theophilus to understand that that's who these men were. Uh, and and he, he, I think there's a couple different hints <laughs> that Theophilus is supposed to imply that these are angels. And one is what they're wearing. They're wearing white robes. And that's the same thing that the angels were wearing back in John chapter 20, verse 12. And if you think about it, white is not a, an uncommon color for people to wear today. But back in those days, I mean, you weren't washing your clothes every day. Uh, white probably would have been a color that was reserved for people in, like, the upper classes, right? Because it would be filthy. I mean, you'd go one day, dust is flying around, animals everywhere, you know, <laughs> you're walking, you know, barefoot or with sandals, maybe through mud, you're getting rained on. It, it, white is a very impractical color. I used to work for Honda, the car company, and I worked in an office, but everyone in the whole company wore uniforms, even, like, the senior level management, and they were uh, totally white uniforms, and they were terrible because you you always you could tell what somebody had for lunch that day by just looking at their shirt, <laughs> or you might drop your pen and the tip of the pen would uh, drag down your shirt, and you'd have this big line down it, and you'd have to wash it out. Uh, it, they were dirty. I couldn't even last one day without getting a stain on this thing, right? So people weren't probably wearing pure white clothing back in the ancient days, at least not in places like this. Maybe in the more metropolitan areas, but not, uh, you know, not hanging out on the east side of Jerusalem. <laughs> so anyway, that's one tip that they were angels. And then another tip is that they seem to have some insights into Jesus's departure and arrival or sorry, departure and his later return that no human being would have. They said that Jesus was going to return in the same way that he was, he had just departed from them. Well, how could they know that unless they were angels or a heavenly being or God had spoken to them, right? So I think it's pretty safe to assume that these guys were angels. All right, our last verse for this study, verse 11, sorry, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Following Jesus' departure and their conversation with these two men, the disciples go back to the big city. They return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And that the Mount of Olives was roughly a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem. So uh, a couple things to talk about there. This probably should have been a break-off study, but... I think this was before I decided to do the break-off studies, so <laughs> you must endure. <clears throat> the Sabbath day was a day of rest for the Jews. It was every Saturday, okay? So on this special day of the week, they were only, they weren't supposed to do any kind of, quote, regular work, and there's a lot of requirements back in the Old Testament describing what could be done and what couldn't be done on the Sabbath day, but uh, they weren't supposed to take long journeys, and so what's referenced here is that they walked about a Sabbath day's journey, about how far a person was supposed to walk on any given Saturday. Anything longer than that might be a risk being considered a, a long journey. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 29, this is described a little bit. It says, See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. All right, so again, you're supposed to stay home. It's a day of rest. Alongside God's Sabbath instructions, though, the Jews had created a lot of traditions, which, you know, some were good, some were not so good. <laughs> and they had come up with all these interpretations about what God's laws meant, and they had given specifics for what people uh, were allowed to do. So using verses like Exodus 16, verse 29, Numbers 35, 5, and Joshua 3, verse 4, 
they, these, these Jewish teachers, these rabbis, had come up with this number that they said was a Sabbath day's journey. You weren't allowed to walk further than this. And it was about 2,000 cubits, uh, which is about 3,000 feet, or 0.57 miles. Or for our Europeans, 0.91 kilometers. <laughs> And Josephus, who was a, a Jewish historian, he mentions that the Mount of Olives was five furlongs from, from Jerusalem. Okay, are you lost yet? <laughs> We're going to just skip to the end here. Josephus says that uh, the Mount of Olives was five furlongs from Jerusalem, which is just about what we would expect of that, that uh, 3,000 feet. Right, that 0.91 kilometers. So that all matches up. And part of the reason that I included all this detail is because I learned a big lesson from this. Before studying for these notes, I thought, and I even taught, that God had implemented the distance restriction on the Jews on the Sabbath day, that he was the one who said you couldn't walk more than a half a mile on the Sabbath day. Right? And I thought for sure that was somewhere in the Old Testament. I didn't exactly know where it was, but you know, I said, oh yeah, it, you know, it's, it's in there. However, when I Googled how far is a Sabbath day's journey, the search results uh, enlightened me. What was interesting is that when I searched it originally, it said 2,000 cubits, and then it gave some, verse, some verses to back that up. But when I clicked into those verses and started researching this a little bit more to try to find the exact verse where the distance was, was stated, I couldn't find it and kind of was odd to me. And so I did a little bit more digging and it wasn't long before I realized that the 2000 cubit restriction wasn't actually in God's law, that it was only a tradition that the rabbis had come up with. There was no stated distance uh, in the Old Testament. And you might be like, well, what does this, what does this even matter? <laughs> but, but what I'd realized is that I had, I had been telling people wrong. I had taught wrong that God had designated this. And really, it was just a tradition that I had heard repeated so many times that I thought that it was in the Bible. Maybe you can see now the lesson that I learned. That is, we have to be really careful that we're going and looking into the scriptures ourselves rather than allowing people to tell us what they say and allowing traditions that have been repeated so many times to get into our minds and we begin to think that those traditions are actually commands from God. And this is really the whole heart behind this study and all the studies that we've been doing on this channel. We've got to get into the text for ourselves and read it for ourselves so we know what's there. There's so many people who are being told, whether by a preacher or a pastor or some Christian author, that the Bible says this, the Bible teaches this, this is the way that you should be as a Christian, this is, this is the, uh, the route that you should take in life, this is how you discern the will of God, this is how you know, these are God's character uh, characteristics, um, this is what God accepts, what he doesn't accept, this is the way that you should interpret the, the Bible versus this system of interpreting the Bible. It, there's so much contradictory information out there in the world about the nature of God and what he wants from human beings and what he wants from his church. How do we cut through all of that contradictory information? How do we figure out what's actually true? We have to go do the research for ourselves. We have to get into the text for ourselves. We've got to put all of our beliefs on the table and say, okay, any of these might be wrong. And I'm willing to discard any of these beliefs if the Bible shows me something different. And then we can go to the text, we can be honest, with God and with his word, uh, and we can try to be as unbiased as we possibly can be and figure this stuff out for ourselves. So I was enlightened when I actually did the research and questioned whether my traditions were biblical. They weren't. <laughs> my, my thought on the Sabbath day's journey was wrong. Uh, and hopefully that lesson teaches us that we could be wrong about a lot of other things. And so if you want to cut through all of the talk about what the Bible says and actually just look into the Bible yourself, I'd encourage you to come along with this study. And that includes the things that I say, because as I just mentioned, I can say things that are wrong. Maybe I'm misinterpreting a verse. Maybe I'm not getting it right. 
I'm presenting you with this information so that you can come to your own conclusions. And I, I hope I'm right. I think I'm right on some things. Uh, but study for yourself. And maybe if I'm wrong, you can correct me if you see it more plainly than me. All right. So that is the lesson from the Sabbath day's journey. I think I have a video about that on my channel, but uh, I will be continuing to upload information uh, about the book of Acts, new handouts, new resources on a daily basis. Check back on the website because not everything on the website gets turned into a video. Some of it just doesn't lend itself to, to that kind of content. But check the website. You can download all this stuff. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I need to say. Check out my wife's course if that's something you're interested in uh, down in the description. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming along and, uh, and doing this study. I think it's important. These studies don't get a lot of views on, on YouTube compared to a lot of other videos that get made. But um, the reason I continue to do them and spend so much time doing them is because I feel like I feel like they're important, and I hope that, that they have an impact on people for good. So until next time, we will finish off, hopefully, chapter two, or <laughs> chapter one, next time. Uh, until then, I hope you have a uh, fantastic day, and keep studying.